Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Betsy Stofsky. I'll be moderating the chat on heart rhythm care in adults and children. And we're very pleased today to have Dr. Peter Aziz. He is a um, cardiologist and electrophysiologist in our uh, children's hospital. And his specialty is treating children with arrhythmias. And Dr. Chung, who is from our um, section of electrophysiology and pacing. And she treats adults with um, elect uh, electrical problems in the heart, and together they actually are part of our inherited arrhythmia um, clinic that treats families, um, adults and children, with heart rhythm problems. So we're very happy to have them here today, and we have quite a few questions that we'll uh, start getting to. Welcome, Dr. Aziz and Dr. Chung. Thank you. Okay, today um, we're going to start with Wolf Parkinson White. Um, and the first question is from Paul, and he says his son has WPW with runs of tachycardia. His doctor thinks ablation is the best option for him. Are there types of ablation that is better for Wolf Parkinson White? I think I'll field this. Uh, Dr. Aziz? Since, uh, I think I'll field this since we're talking about a pediatric patient here. Uh, mm -hmm. Wolf Parkinson White is, uh, is a relatively common disorder. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we of, of all the arrhythmia disorders that we see, this is certainly up there, probably top one or two, and one of the most common reasons why people get ablations. In the scenario where a pediatric patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome has palpitations like your son does, ablation is really considered the primary uh, therapy for a couple different reasons. One, to manage the palpitations, of course, and the other, more important, but fortunately, less common reason is to prevent uh, sudden cardiac death from having an accessory pathway. So the purpose of the ablation really is to find where this pathway is uh, and to really assess the properties of it, uh, determine the risk of the pathway, and typically to get rid of it if it's deemed safe. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aziz. Um, our next question, let's see if Dr. Chung can come on here. Oh, that just happened. There we go. Dr. Chung. Um, we just talked about WPW in a child, but um, Suzanne has had two previously unsuccessful ablations for WPW, and she wants to know if there's other options or is there still hope for her um, with another ablation in treating her WPW? Yes, there's always hope. We don't give up very easily. Uh, in your question, you had asked about whether uh, hospital uh, option, what, what the other options are. First of all, there's always medications. Some medications can be helpful in suppressing a accessory pathway conduction that um, causes WPW, and another ablation uh, can also be tried. And that is always uh, an option. Uh, the third is uh, surgery. So we hardly ever have to do cardiac surgery to get rid of an accessory pathway nowadays because uh, catheter ablation is so successful. So, um, you know, there are several reasons for why it may be difficult to get an accessory pathway. Sometimes it's due to how near it is to your normal conduction system, or it's difficult for certain doctors to get there. And I really do think it's worthwhile trying to uh, go at it again if you're still having symptoms. And you know, we're happy to see you here as well to try to go uh, someplace where a specialty group. We can bring um, our next question is for Dr. Aziz, um, and it's a, from Amala. Her, um, hus her ex-husband had surgery to correct Epstein's anomaly and WPW. Her son is now 12 and having short of breath problems. She wants to know if those conditions are hereditary. More, more often than not, uh, a congenital anomaly like Epstein's anomaly 
is not hereditary. If somebody in the family has it, there's a, a pretty small uh, increase in the likelihood that somebody else will have it. But nevertheless, it's still uncommon enough that we don't screen people in the family, for instance, for something like Epstein's anomaly. Shortness of breath, on the other hand, is a pretty common thing for a pediatric patient to have. Uh, what I would think is uh, that this patient see their pediatrician for a more general assessment of the shortness of breath. Uh, could be asthma, could be things that are non-cardiac that are, are, in my opinion, more likely than a, a rare thing like Epstein's anomaly is. Uh, and certainly after the evaluation, if things are pointing in the cardiac direction, then, uh, then a cardiologist can help them work through uh, how to really diagnose what the shortness of breath is about. But I think concluding would be to say that it's pretty unlikely that it would be uh, Epstein's anomaly. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Um, as far as adults and Dr. Aziz and children that come into your um, clinics, what are the clues that would make you think that you need to have the family, full family assessed? So, Dr. Aziz, do you want to start that out with children? And then, Dr. Chung, you can um, talk about with adults how you bring into the, the family in this situation. That's a great question. This is something that Dr. Chung and I actually worked together on. Uh, the, the red flags we consider in the family are typically, as one might suppose, whenever there is more than one patient in a family that is afflicted with a cardiac disease, I think that's, that's probably the easiest way to start. Uh, that said, there are other things that run in families where we see a pediatric patient with a condition and have to do a little bit of searching to find other family members that also have that condition. Uh, typically, if somebody has a sudden cardiac arrest at a young age or a passing out spell uh, that we think is of cardiac nature, uh, then that's something that, that we oftentimes will, will look at other family members for and try to find other clues of disease in other family members by screening them. Uh, so those are a couple of the conditions that tip us off as clinicians to, to go digging in the family. Dr. Chang? And I think I, I agree with Peter. The main um, important clue is in the family history. So if you come for an appointment then on a certain condition you suspect may run in your family, um, it will be really helpful to um, you know actually ask different members of your family if they have what their medical history is. And you know there are some where. Uh, the manifestation may be more subtle. It may not be what you actually are experiencing. For example, for atrial fibrillation, a lot of atrial fibrillation runs in families. And maybe you didn't know that your uncle had atrial fibrillation, but he had a stroke. Um, you know, and that could be a, a clue. And there are a lot of clues like that. A lot of people who think that they uh, that their their father had a heart attack. Well, it may not have been a heart attack due to blockages of the arteries, but it could have been a sudden death that you have to kind of explore and find out what the circumstances were. So we try to take a pretty detailed family history, and um, based on that, we would um, be happy to see family members that are affected. If we do genetic testing, um, you know, then then we need to know who to test and and you know the. Uh, often it's the person who had the first or most severe manifestation that we might want to try to see it, uh, if we can get genetic testing on. And then if something is found in that family member, you can go and test the other members of the family that you suspect may have a condition. Um, but there, you know, with some of the newer tests that uh, we're doing, some to try to actually pin down the actual mutation or actual genetic variant that's causing it. We um, might want to also evaluate uh, people that um, do not have that condition. So um, that sometimes helps, helps narrow down the actual genetic uh, problem. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, there's a few questions on atrial fibrillation, and I know that's something that you deal with a lot, Dr. Chung. So I'm going to direct these to you. Um, and I'm going to start with the first one from Tim. And he asks, he's having his first ablation on Thursday for a case of long-standing persistent AFib. How should I expect to feel for the first few days and weeks post-op? 
and he says thank you for doing these chats. Well, it's our pleasure. Um, well, you know, I usually tell my patients that they might feel a little hungover afterwards because we give a lot of sedation. Some of these procedures are done under local anesthesia with IV sedatives, and others are done with under general anesthesia. So, you know, you're going to feel the effects of, of some of the sedatives that we give and the anesthetics we give. So some people um, will feel great afterwards, and others will kind of feel a little, you know, not, not quite back to normal um, for even a few days. And um, you may end up feeling a little sore in your groin. Um, and, you know, that's to be expected. You'll probably not want to do a lot of heavy lifting or strenuous activity um, for even up to a week. Some people may feel a little chest soreness, um, but in general, I think that that uh, you know that that those sensations will get better and better with time over the few days after an ablation, um, like atrial fibrillation. You also, if you have persistent atrial fib. Uh, you may need to get a cardioversion, so you may feel a little soreness just from the cardioversion, like a, a, a little skin burn. Um, you can give, you know, steroid things to try to uh, ease that. But um, you also might feel some palpitations. There's, uh, with the ablation, you'll get uh, you know, radio frequency energy and breathing energy. Sometimes there can be uh, a lot of inflammation heart that uh, settles down, so we often will put people on antrimic drugs for a couple of months to try to settle down some of the palpitations that happen just from um, an ablation. Thank you. Um, Janet wants to know about lone AFib um, to permanent AFib, and maybe she's talking about paroxysmal AFib, can, or an AFib you know, that occurs occasionally, can it turn into permanent AFib? And then if you have AFib for a long time, can it go back to being um, something that happens now and then? Um, yes, it can. Actually, the term permanent um, is kind of a relative term. And it's basically indicating that the patient and physician has de have decided not to pursue sinus rhythm anymore. So it's kind of a decision rather than um, a state. It usually means that the person is in atrial fibrillation all the time and you've decided not to try to get back into normal rhythm. But even in people who have a very long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, we can often get a lot of those people back into sinus rhythm. Um, so yes, you can uh, change in, in various states and in fact we, we uh, hope to be able to do that to get people back into sinus rhythm. And it's interesting that I think, um, you know, this, uh, that uh, I think the person who, who wrote in this question said that you actually may have a little uh, uh, lessening of the symptoms. And that's not uncommon because if you're going in and out of atrial fib, you may feel the palpitations or the transitions between AFib and sinus rhythm or sinus rhythm and AFib. So you may feel, uh, feel it a little more rather than uh, the state where you're in AFib all the time and you're not kind of going back and forth between slow and rapid heart rates. But I think a lot of medications can help with that. And ablation especially can be um, helpful in, in where, especially where uh, medications may fail. Mm -hmm. And then um, Loretta asks about the diagnosis of AFib. She wants to know, she has a paroxysmal AFib but also bradycardia. And she wants to know if she needs to have an EP study to pinpoint the problem. She also has a history of PE, DVT, and an IVC filter. She wants to know if that eliminates her as a candidate for an EP study. Well, um, bradycardia comes very frequently associated with atrial fibrillation. It's, because in atrial fibrillation, the heart can be going very rapidly. But a lot of the medications that we use to try to slow the heart rate down during the atrial fibrillation, when you do convert back to normal rhythm, then in normal rhythm, those medications can make you on the slow side. Also, a lot of people with atrial fibrillation have what we call sick sinus syndrome, and that could be made worse with some of the medications used to control the rapid heart rhythms. Uh, so they do kind of often coexist. Uh, the rapid and the slow heart rhythms. And in terms of an EP study, you know, the electrophysiology study 
is helpful, um, especially if we're trying to go for an ablation. I think the bradycardia, the slow heart rates, we can pick up pretty readily with, um, with uh, some ambulatory monitoring. Uh, we can pinpoint a little bit more about where the heart rate slowing occurs if it's due to conduction from top to bottom and if there are any concerns about you know, how dangerous the bradycardia might be. But a lot of that we can pick up from sensitive manner. Now in terms of um, trying to treat the rapid rhythm like atrial fibrillation, we would probably do atrial, uh, an EP study in conjunction with an ablation procedure. That, that unless we're thinking that there's a SVT supervision after at the same time instead of with an ablation procedure, but it's often done, the EP studies done in conjunction with Your question about the having had a pulmonary embolus or deep venous thrombosis is is a, is a tough one. We can do uh, ablation and put catheters up even in have had a filter put in, treated with anticoagulants, be a little bit more challenging. But that doesn't necessarily exclude you. Um, our next question for you is related, is from Gary. He had bypass surgery a couple years ago and he developed a flutter. As a result, he was given Saldolol. He's been on it ever since. Um, on one occasion, he had an EKG, which indicated an episode of AFib. And after wearing an event monitor for one month, the only abnormality revealed were two episodes of tachycardia. So he's not really asking a question. But from that, I guess I would ask, um, expand on that. Like, first of all, what the difference is between a flutter and AFib? And then when someone has AFib after surgery, um, how long do they wait to see if it's actually something that they need to be on meds for for a very long time? So just to go over what these different arrhythmias are, first of all, tachycardia is a very nonspecific term. So tachy means fast and cardia means heart. So that just means that there's a rapid heart rhythm going on, and it doesn't really tell you necessarily what the mechanism is. So atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are types of tachycardia. In, in atrial fibrillation, the electrical impulse goes very rapidly and irregularly through the upper chambers, the atria. Often it starts, the first few beats start from where the pulmonary veins bring blood back uh, from the lungs into uh, the left atrium. And so that's often where we try to uh, target ablation for atrial fibrillation. But once the electrical impulse gets out into the atria, I mean, it goes very rapidly and irregularly. Atrial flutter is a more organized circuit. It could have started off in a similar way and then organized or been organized by medications, but it tends to be a, a, a more organized circuit going around um, the atrium somewhere. So it's something that we could try to map and perhaps burn a line across to try to try to uh, reduce the atrial flutter. Um, let's see, was there another part of that question? I think uh, uh, may cover it. Yeah. Um, the other um, question would be the fact that he had surgery. And so how long do you usually wait until you can say that they actually have AFib, since AFib is so common after heart surgery? Right. Thanks, Betsy. The atrial fibrillation and flutter after surgery is very common, especially in the first few days after surgery while you're still in the hospital. So there's a lot of inflammation that goes on, and it tends to peak on post-operative days two to three, and then goes way down. So once you start having it after afterwards, it may mean that you're more prone to developing it longer term, um, and because your propensity to going into atrial fib flutter, if it's just due to the surgery itself, should be going down. So if you're having atrial fib or flutter, you know, uh, it's it's not necessarily um, just linked to bypass surgery two years ago. It's hard to know what incisions were made into the heart at that time, if there was another valve operation that was done, or if it was just bypass surgery. If it was just bypass surgery, I would think that, you know, your propensity to having atrial fib or flutter may continue and may need um, medication or even uh, consideration of ablation. Um. 
Okay, I'm going to um, ask one more question here, and then I'll bring Dr. Aziz on as well. Um, Rhonda is a 20-year-old female. She had SVT since she was 16. She was taken to the hospital with it, and her heart rate was almost 300. She was put on a beta blocker and then ablated. Um, all good until last month, so this is four years after ablation. She started having symptoms again, palpitations and shortness of breath. She wants to know if it can come back. It can come back, um, but pretty rarely, I'd say, you know, depending on the type of arrhythmia that was ablated, maybe 5%, up to 5% or so, but it really depends on the type of arrhythmia that was ablated. Some um, atrial tachycardias, for example, may come back um, from the same site or from another site. And I think at this point, it would be really important to try to document what the nature of the recurrences by doing monitoring to try to capture this on a monitor to see if it's the same thing that she was having before or if it's another rhythm abnormality. So it can come back, but it's worthwhile trying to, um, to document and also especially since she's having shortness of breath. So that probably needs to be evaluated further. Um, Dr. Aziz, how common is as, um, fast supraventricular heart rates in um, young people? Uh, it's, it's very common. It's by far the most common reason we see patients with arrhythmias. Uh, the most common reason we take patients to the EP lab for sure to do an ablation. So it's very common. Uh, we probably see, you know, in a busy, uh, a busy electrophysiologist will probably see about maybe five or ten of these patients a week, something like that. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the topic of long QT, which I know is one of your interests, and we have some questions about that. Um, the first one is from Lil. She was told that um, her QT interval prolongs when she takes beta blockers. She has palpitations. Her testing showed PVCs and PACs. She's never fainted and never tested for long QT. She has no family history, but she wants to know if she needs to avoid meds that prolong her QT intervals. That's a very complex question. I think the first thing that that one needs to consider is is if a QTC really is long, why is it long? Is it long because of an inherited problem that she got from her mother or father, or is it long because of uh, uh, acquired things like taking medication or having an electrolyte imbalance? For instance, potassium, low potassium could cause that. Low calcium could cause that. Uh, so that's the first step. And then the next step, of course, is, is once you figure out which one of those things it is, is trying to be preventative uh, and, and a step ahead of the game. But a lot of that is predicated on why it's happening in the first place. If it is an acquired thing, then we typically tell patients to avoid medications that prolong the QT interval like she had been alluding to. Uh, and if it's congenital, we also do the same. Typically, in, in patients with congenital long QT syndrome where it is inherited, the beta blockers don't really act to change the QT interval per se. They more act to uh, decrease the heart rate during uh, emotional stress or physical exertion. Uh, so at any rate, it's a, it's a complex answer, but it's also a complex problem. It certainly needs to be evaluated by a heart rhythm specialist. Mm -hmm. um, so connected to that, Hank asks, can a cardiologist pick up a long QT syndrome from an EKG? How would you know if you have it or not? Yeah, usually the EKG is the, the first line in diagnosis. Uh, most patients with prolonged QT interval or long QT syndrome even will have manifestations on their ECG. Uh, and a good amount of those patients, the EKG will be diagnostic. You'll look at it and say this person definitely has long QT syndrome. In some patients, though, it's a little bit more elusive. Some of their ECGs will show it and some of them won't. Sometimes provocative testing like an exercise stress test can help manifest a patient that has a normal EKG at baseline. Uh, other things like, as Dr. Chung alluded to, uh, genetic testing can be really the gold standard these days for, for diagnosis. Uh, the only downside is that uh, we don't have results right away. It takes a little while to run the test, uh, and there's a, an expense associated with it that's variably covered by insurance companies. So usually an electrophysiologist will look at an ECG and then determine what tests, if any, are needed thereafter to, to diagnose long QT syndrome. 
Um, Fran says that her daughter's due with her first child, and her cousin recently had a baby who died with long QT syndrome. Her husband and, I, and she has not been told that they have long QT, but she wonders if the daughter should be tested. I think the, the most types of long QT syndrome are inherited in a dominant pattern, which is to say that they typically don't skip generations. So if this couple's, if Rain and her husband's child were to have long QT syndrome, that would mean that one of them had it as well. I think it makes more sense to look at the cousin that had a baby that passed away and test the parents, see which one of the parents has it, and then link that uh, if if it can be linked back to uh, the back to friend and her husband, there's a good chance that there is no link and that this baby doesn't need to have an EKG. That said, if it, if it becomes very convoluted in, in terms of trying to figure out who has what and and we can't really get these people to go see a doctor, uh, getting an EKG is a pretty reasonable thing in somebody with a family history of long QT syndrome. It's inexpensive, it's non-invasive, but I would recommend doing it. Uh, I would recommend doing it at least two weeks after the baby's born. The newborn ECGs can sometimes have false positive results, meaning that it shows long QT, a long QT interval, but really the patient is totally normal. Um, next, Linda says that her daughter passed out at school and she's been going through testing. Finally, they believe it is a long QT diagnosis and they want to put a defibrillator in her. She is 11 and they want to know if that's what you would recommend and what she should know about, about that. That's you. I'm so sorry. Would you be able to repeat the question? We're just getting, getting some overhead noise. Okay, sorry about that. Um, Linda's daughter passed out at school and she was going through testing. They think it's a long QT diagnosis and they want to put a defibrillator in her. She's 11 years old and they said, is that what you would recommend and what should she know? In a, in a patient that's 12 years old, that's a very, in any, in any pediatric patient really, that's a very complicated question. I think a lot goes into that decision uh, and it should be a very careful uh, and very well thought of decision, of course. I would say that in a, in, a, in a patient that's a pediatric patient with long QT syndrome, fortunately, there are a good, uh, there's a good data out there that tells us what are the indications for a defibrillator. Uh, most of that data is based on symptoms of having a cardiac arrest off of, uh, or excuse me, on medicine. Um, so I think that uh, in this situation, what I would recommend is is that there be a pretty thorough evaluation by a heart rhythm specialist, somebody with a lot of experience in this type of thing. And again, that decision can't be taken lightly. Uh, getting a second opinion for something like that is a reasonable idea, as, as one would expect. A defibrillator in a young patient really is a, is a difficult decision to make. Thank you. Um, our next question and our last question about long QT, and I'm going to bring Dr. Chung on this as well, um, is about is somebody who has long QT syndrome and her heart is enlarged. She's on a beta blocker and she feels very tired. She has low blood pressure, shortness of breath, and palpitations. What could be done? So is are beta blockers the treatment of choice for long QT, Dr. Aziz? And then Dr. Chung, you can... Um, Talk about what happens with adult patients who are having these symptoms. Beta blockers are certainly the, the primary modality of therapy. Uh, there's, there's good evidence out there that beta patients that are compliant with beta blockade reduce their risk uh, quite a bit to the point where having breakthrough events, having passing out events, or, or even uh, an arrest is very rare in patients that, that are under good beta blocker therapy. Uh, and I'll defer the the remainder of the question of Dr. Chung. Uh, Dr. Chung, so she's having a lot of um, symptoms of shortness of breath. Um, she is um, feeling tired and um, her heart's enlarged and she wants to know what can be done. Right, those are can be common side effects of beta blockers. And there may need to be some dosage adjustment or change to a different form of a beta blocker. 
if her heart is enlarged and um, is is weak, if there is weakness with the heart enlargement, um, it's worthwhile trying to figure out why that is. Because long QT in and of itself doesn't necessarily cause your heart to be enlarged. So it's pretty important to try to figure out, you know, what is the scoop with that. And there are some cardiomyopathies, some weaknesses of heart muscle where Beta blockers are also used and have been shown to help people live longer. So, you know, she may need the beta blockers, but um, I think more importantly, perhaps it's, you know, it's time to figure out why her heart is enlarged. Is that why her blood pressure is low? Is that why she has shortness of breath? Um, and then to also further assess whether or not she's at risk for something like sudden death. Um, that may or may not be related to the long QT syndrome. Thank you. Um, Dr. Aziz, do you have anything else to add about long QT? Well, I agree with Dr. Chung. I think, I think in this scenario, if there's, if there's cardiac enlargement that really clouds the, the picture, oftentimes when the heart's not normal, the EKG cannot be normal too, and the QTC can be long as a result secondarily of, of uh, underlying uh, what we call a cardiomyopathy, where the heart muscle is weak. So I agree with Dr. Chung. I think, you know, I think the investigation needs to be needs to be done. Thank you. Um, we're going to switch the conversation to PACs and palpitations. Um, uh, Dr. Chung, David has PACs, and um, he suspects they're benign because his sinus is 52 beats per minute. His PACs are 82 consistently and with exercise, I think he's saying 70s to 80s. He confirms that all, can you please, I think he's asking you to confirm that all PACs are not equal and that the PACs um, probably provides good heart pumping efficiency. Maybe you could just um, talk about PACs and what they actually mean for patients. All right, PAC stands for premature atrial contractions. So that means, premature means that they come early in uh, timing. So if you're in a regular sinus rhythm that comes, you know, at a very regular rate, the PACs will come early. And, um, and then there's often a compensatory pause, so a we'll pause before the next beat, the next normal beat actually comes. So often what people feel are kind of, they may not actually feel the premature beat, the early atrial beat. Because that beat comes in early, it doesn't have as much time to fill the heart. So you may actually, instead of just feeling a, 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 a double beat, what you feel is the compensatory pause. Because then um, there's a little pause and it allows the heart to fill even further for the next beat coming in. So often what people feel is kind of a skip and a hard beat. Feel skip and a hard beat. So depending on the timing, you know, the, there is a contraction going on, and, but it may not be quite as efficient um, as a normal beat. But still, I think you're, you know, it, in, in general, they, you would be getting, uh, sometimes people will feel on their pulse half the rate if it's going every other beat. Um, and it really depends on the timing, and the state of health of uh, the person. Because a lot of people can have thousands of PACs and not feel anything. And other people will feel um, just a few and feel every single one. So it's very variable from person to person in terms of how much you'll feel with it. Thank you. Um, Gordon says that he's 35. Um, his palpitations are increasing in frequency. His family doctor was not worried um, because he's only 35, but sent him to for a stress test. And during the test, he had a lot and a lot in groups. And now he's scheduled for an echo. And he wants to know what could be causing the PACs. Um, it's not that clear from his question whether or not they're PACs or PVCs, right? So that he's feeling palpitations. And it would be good to figure out if they're coming from the upper chamber or the lower chamber. Um, and you know, I think in this in in this case, the the doctor's doing the right thing in getting an echocardiogram. This make sure that the heart function is normal. Make sure that there's no other structural heart disease, valve problems, or anything like that that could be contributing to the extra beats that he's feeling. 
So it's just part of the risk stratification and, and to try to see what the significance of these palpitations are. Thanks. Um, Stephanie wants to know if palpitations can increase uh, due to hormones. She said that hers seem to get worse at times and she wonders if it was related. Oh, definitely. Hormones can contribute. They can change recovery, refractory periods in the heart. There are a lot of hormone influences. It's pretty common, actually, that that um, in women, for example, I can I, I'll have patients that come and and they they uh, relate um, an increase in palpitations before the menstrual period begins. Uh, there could be kind of a an acting up of palpitations around menopause. So it's actually quite common to um, hear about hormonally related um, increases in palpitations. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're going to um, switch our topic to heart block and sick sinus syndrome. And we actually have our first question is related to um, a child. Um, George says that his son is five and has been diagnosed with AV heart block, second degree type two, with intermittent third degree, and the doctors recommend that he has a pacemaker. He wants to know how long the pacemakers last and will he have normal activity? Dr. Aziz. The, the, typically the, the indication for a uh, pacemaker in a patient with AV node conduction disease or heart block uh, are, are pretty strict. Uh, I, for, we saw a patient, as a matter of fact, today with this. Uh, there's a list of about five things that we look for. And in the absence of those five things, a lot of times those patients can be followed conservatively without a pacemaker. So I just want to make the point that there are a lot of patients that have this problem that don't get pacemakers, and that's a very appropriate decision, and, and the patient is perfectly safe uh, without a pacemaker. In the event that, uh, for instance, a five-year-old child would need a pacemaker, uh, then typically that decision is, is really a surgical one. The, the types of pacemakers are, are, are really two different types. There's one that goes inside the vein of the, of the heart, so those are the ones that are implanted up here on the chest where the leads go inside the heart. That's something that people like Dr. Chung and I can do a, as electrophysiologists. In a patient that's five, it's a little bit bigger of a decision in that the leads have to be epicardial, meaning that they go on the outside of the heart. So a cardiothoracic surgeon would, would actually have to expose the heart muscle itself and attach the leads to the actual heart muscle and then put the pacemaker, the battery of the, of the pacemaker in the belly. Uh, and again, that tends to be a little bit more involved of a procedure. All the more reason to uh, uh, to, to proceed with caution in a five-year-old uh, and really uh, with a fine-tooth comb dissect the reasons why uh, somebody might need a pacemaker. What does um, a second opinion involve then if you wanted to bring a child to see you? It sounds like you would suggest that in some of these strategies before you would proceed with something drastic, like you're saying, a device in a child that maybe people would want a second opinion. What does that involve? Sure. Uh, depending on the problem, of course, there are, there are ways to, to plug into our clinic. Uh, obviously, we have uh, uh, website pages that, that show our, our contact information, and, and I'm sure we're going to provide that as part of this webcast. But typically speaking, if somebody has uh, you know, an opinion and they're coming in for another opinion. We, we always take, obviously, in the heed what has been said before, doctors that have known you for a long time have very good insights. We want to see testing. We want to see uh, what uh, evaluation has been done prior. That helps us a lot in making our decision. And then we use those records, and we meet with the family, and we, we talk, and we say, well, this is what we think. And, and a lot of times it does coincide with what's been said in the past with decisions that are that are more involved, like adding devices to pediatric patients. Uh, you know, in, in my opinion, it does seem reasonable to go to a, an institution that, that does a lot of this just to, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. But that's a pretty uh, simple and straightforward thing to do and something that we do here quite a bit. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Mike. 
And this is um, an adult patient who has a dual pace, uh, chamber pacemaker for sick sinus syndrome. And he's been experiencing many PVCs. His resting pulse rate is about 50. And he's been getting up to about 20 PVCs per minute. He has an alive core monitor. He wants to know at what point should he be following up with his electrophysiologist. Dr. Chung? Uh, especially if this is new, it's probably worthwhile transmitting, sending those uh, live core um, strips to your electrophysiologist. And um, it's just sometimes uh, paste beats will look like PVCs. So it's worthwhile having an electrophysiologist take a look at your recordings. Um, so it, your, your pacemaker could be tracking an upper chamber, a PAC, an atrial beat, or it could be a ventricular beat. Um, but if you're starting to have something that is new and different for you, it's probably worthwhile getting in contact. Um, you know, there are various things that it could be, and you want to make sure your pacemaker is functioning okay, that the lead's not moving, and you know, if, if, depending on how new the pacemaker is before the leads get socked in, uh, just make sure that they're not, it's not dislodging. Um, or if it is due to extra beats, then why is that happening? It's probably worthwhile looking into. Thank you. Um, our next topic is Brugada um, syndrome. Um, Dr. Aziz, Ben says his sister is 30 and was just diagnosed with Brugada. She called to tell him that he, sh he should also be tested too. What exactly is Brugada and what does the testing involve? Is it a blood test? Should he avoid, avoid certain things until he finds out. So could we first start by explaining what Brugada actually is? Well, I'll first say that uh, his sister is right. He definitely should be tested. Uh, the, the Brugada syndrome is, um, is a syndrome that was first uh, coined about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, where uh, the description really is based on an EKG finding. And then with that finding in, in certain patients with Brugada syndrome, we can to some degree, predict their risk of, of sudden cardiac death. So the patients that have what we call a sp spontaneous Brugada pattern, ones that uh, on a resting EKG show signs of Brugada syndrome, we think are at higher risk, and the patients that have had symptoms in the past. Uh, so the, the testing for it is, is relatively simple in that we'll do an ECG. Sometimes if the ECG is abnormal and we're still, still trying to figure out whether a patient has Brugada syndrome, they may do other provocative tests like a drug challenge, administer a drug, see if the EKG changes at all as a way of provoking the, the change to happen. Uh, and uh, there's some debate about an, an, uh, an electrophysiology study. But as far as screening, the screening process, the first step is, is getting a, an EKG test. The other important piece of this, particularly if, the, if her brother knows that, that they have it, is gene testing. So if there's been gene testing in the past and somebody has a genetic marker and the genetic markers in Brugada uh, aren't in every case, it's, it's certainly in a subset of patients, but if there is a gene marker, that would be a very useful thing to test other family members for. Is um, Brugada syndrome something that would be common to find out when you are 30, or is it something that's mostly found in children? Dr. Chung? I'm sorry. Oh. Can, can you repeat that, Betsy? I couldn't yes. really hear. I'm just wondering this. Um, Ben's sister is 30, and I wondered if it's common for people to, um, are we still having trouble hearing? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to take you off air for a minute. I'll let Dr. Aziz answer that first. Sure. Uh, Brugada syndrome can can present in a in a variety of ages. Uh, typically, it's it's something that we, from a symptom standpoint, don't see in very young kids. Typically, the the patients will be older, but it can occur uh, in in even infants. But that's not very common. Uh, most of the time, it'll occur in somebody that's uh, in their teenage years or older. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chung, do you have anything to add to that about Brugada in adults? 
I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. Do you have anything, um, can you talk about Brugada in adults? I think we're still having trouble with the... Uh... Well, we certainly do see Brugada syndrome uh, present to us as well. And, um, and you know, sometimes it's actually an, a Brugada e EKG can be brought on by certain medications. So some of our intermittent drugs, uh, sodium channel blockers that we use, for example, for atrial fibrillation might bring, in, might bring it on, uh, bring on EKG changes that are similar. And even uh, de novo, people who uh, present with arrhythmias may be found to have Brugada syndrome, or we just uh, are, are asked to take a look at it. So in that regard, um, we will go through the same thing as in pediatrics. We need to try to figure out what the risk of sudden death is. And, uh, and there are certain things to avoid, and um, uh, you know, it, it, including fever. It's recommended that the fevers be treated pretty aggressively with Tylenol or whatever to try to, uh, because sometimes you can get more of a Brugada um, EKG during times of fever. Um, there's a website called, I think it's brugada.org in terms of uh, going through uh, medications to avoid. Thank you. Um, I like this question um, from um, Joseph. He says that, um, when is more research going to be done to cure these arrhythmias? I feel like um, the medical community has put more energy into stopping arrhythmias after they've reared their ugly head than figuring out how to prevent them. So um, can you talk about if there's, um, are you doing research or what kind of research is going on out there about um, some of these inherited arrhythmias and just arrhythmias in general? That's a great question. Go ahead, Dr. Chen. <laughs> We're all passionate about this, so we all want to jump in. Yeah. We all are working on this, and actually, the you know the fact that we have an inherited arrhythmia center is part of that. Um, you know, we we're in an exciting time right now, um, where a lot of the research done in arrhythmias, you're right, are have been based on diagnosed arrhythmias, people who have had, had them present, and then we often chosen to study certain pathways or certain drugs that are related to the electrical system because we know that they're they're electrically you know mediated electric electrical conditions um, but we are in a very exciting time where we have new technologies and there have been you know sequencing and the, the genome and we can test the a person's genes to figure out a lot more about what causes these arrhythmias, and we can actually do these big uh, 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 genetic uh, genetic association studies to try to figure out what genes are actually involved in a condition. So instead of us trying to guess and say, "Oh, I'm going to study the sodium channel because it's probably related to atrial fibrillation," we can actually do these big studies to look at what genes and what pathways and proteins may be involved um, in, a, in a condition by studying a lot of people that have the condition and letting um, the individual genomes the, the, uh, from that person tell us what is involved. So it's a very exciting time that we're able uh, to do this. And so we've, you know, all of us have been working on this for these things for uh, uh, several years and there have been a lot of advances uh, to try to uh, identify some of the genes and some of the pathways that are involved. And from looking at that, what we're trying to do is to now make the next steps. Are there targets that we're not hitting to try to uh, prevent these arrhythmias from happening? So that's a huge, um, huge area of research that you'll hopefully see a lot more uh, uh, productivity um, in, in the future, in the next few years even. Dr. Aziz? Uh, that's a great, that's a really good question. I, I remember reading that and thinking, wow, that's going to be a tough one to answer. Uh, so I, I think the, the most simplistic way of thinking of cardiovascular disease are of two forms, the acquired and the congenital. And, and a lot of work has been done uh, recently in preventing the acquired type of disease like coronary artery disease, the things that cause heart attacks. Uh, 
managing obesity, managing diabetes. I think the, the congenital arrhythmias, the inherited arrhythmias are a little bit more difficult because one, we're first really discovering how, how they happen. So we're figuring out, yeah, that this is the gene and this is, this is what it causes. Preventing the gene transmission or preventing the expression of the gene, I think we're, we'll get there, but I don't think we're going to be getting there tomorrow. I think this is going to be a, a, a marathon type of run for us. Uh, uh, fortunately, the, the, with the acquired type of things, there is, uh, you know, there is a goal here in that you modify daily activity, you modify this, you modify that, and uh, your disease responds. And, and unfortunately, in the inherited arrhythmia realm, there is no easy fix like that. There is no preventative strategies that we know of other than saying we can identify that this is what you have and this is the gene that made it that way. And then here's a pill to, to help pre prevent the gene from manifesting itself in bad ways. That's as far as we've gone now. I agree with Dr. Chung. This is what inspires her and I really on a daily basis because we could help a lot of people if we got to the, the core of this in terms of prevention. But that's a, a very uh, provocative uh, thought. Very fundamental and very important. And even some of the genetic, uh, you know, we, we've gone through in our research to ask ourselves, well, we found these genetic markers associated with the disease. So does that mean we're predestined to get the manifestations of that condition? And I think we can tell from our patients that it's not necessarily all predetermined. But those questions are really, really, really important. For example, for atrial fibrillation, there are some genes that are associated with atrial fib, but we don't get it, even though we're born with those genes. We don't get it usually until you know, later decades of life, than when you're 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So there, uh, that brings up an opportunity that, that we may be able to find um, lifestyle changes or medications, um, and these are being highlighted as ways to prevent even atrial fibrillation. So I think it is an exciting time. Um, Peter's right. It will be a marathon. It's going to take a lot of work, funding. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try and get through some of these questions of people that are on here um, today. So we'll just... Um, get through these. The first one is um, John Mons. He wants to know if there's data out there that links atrial fib with um, ventricular tachycardia. And can AFib cause ventricular tachycardia as a result of increased physical activity in people with AFib? Dr. Chung? That's a tough question. And, you know, there there are two different arrhythmias. So in general, when you get atrial fibrillation, you don't necessarily get ventricular fibrillation. Although Peter, Dr. Aziz told us, you know, talked about the risk of sudden death with WPW. So that's one area in which it can become life-threatening. If somebody with a fast conducting accessory pathway with uh, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome can conduct that atrial fibrillation down to the ventricles very rapidly. So there are some people that, that may be predisposed to going rapidly in atrial fib and can have some runs of ventricular tachycardia, usually short runs that may not be life-threatening, but especially in people that might have um, so much arrhythmia that their heart muscle may, may be weakened, may make them more prone to ventricular arrhythmias. Um, you can see the two arrhythmias in the same person. Um, and uh, But... It is a very interesting research question in terms of data because you know some of the triggers that may trigger start atrial fibrillation in the pulmonary veins potentially could be um, similar similar uh, there could be a similar pathophysiology a sim similar um, you know triggering focus in some of the ventricular areas so it is a very interesting research question not a lot out there right now on this. Perhaps Peter is a better. Um, David Bell asks, here's a 60-year-old male with a recent diagnosis of VTAC, no sign of blockage or structural issues. He wants to determine a reasonable level of cardiovascular exercise. 
Um, Dr. Chung, maybe you can start, and then Dr. Aziz, maybe you can talk about how you work with your kids, um, your patients that are children, and trying to help them figure out how active they can be if they have arrhythmias. Dr. Chung? Well, I think it's great that um, there's that this uh, um, person has gone through a, a workup to exclude structural heart disease, and uh, and presumably the heart muscle is very strong. There are no significant valve diseases, so there are some forms of ventricular tachycardia that happen with normal hearts, and they in general should be not very life threatening. So it's very important to keep up physical fitness, and I would, um, you know, depending on on what kind of ventricular tachycardia this person has, that this person may be able to do regular forms of exercise. Now, you know, if you're having a lot of very rapid sustained ventricular tachycardia, medications may be needed to suppress that or even ablation um, can be done to try to ablate that. And I wouldn't necessarily want to exercise to the degree that would trigger these. So a, a monitored, um, you know, if, if there's a lot of this going on, sometimes doing a cardiac rehab program where you're exercising on a monitor uh, may be helpful to help uh, gain some guidelines and guidance in terms of how much you can do. Dr. Aziz, how do you help um, parents try to determine the amount of exercise their children can do when they have arrhythmias? It's a very complicated question. As you might guess, uh, it depends. It really depends on what their disease substrate is, whether they have long QT syndrome or just uh, SVT and, or WPW. I think a lot of that predicates what it is they can and can't do. That said, usually this conversation is personalized. So we take their risk profile, even if they have long QT syndrome, just having long QT syndrome is a very... Uh, generalizable term, I think, in this day and age. We want to know what type of long QT syndrome you have, how old you are, what your EKG looks like, whether you had an event before. A lot of go, a lot of that goes into the equation of what they can and can't do. But ultimately, we are cognizant of the fact that sports participation, at least in kids, and obviously in adults too, but particularly in kids, provides them with, with a, you know, a sense of participation, a sense of well-being, a sense of camaraderie, and we think that's important. To deprive them of that, I think, as a knee-jerk, isn't doing them a service. So oftentimes during our visits, the, the sports question really predominates the majority of the time. That's what we spend a lot of time dissecting and discussing. But the answer isn't no. I think that's very plain now. The answer is <clears throat> well, maybe, and it depends, and let's do this, that, and the other to make sure you're safe. Uh, but certainly, cardiovascular activity is important in anybody. So we want to be able to allow them to do that and make sure that they're safe, and, and there's a way to do that, I think. Um, I'm going to, let's see, Charlotte has a long question. Um, she's been out of atrial fibrillation for a year at the end of this month. She's in sinus rhythm now, but sometimes it says sinus bradycardia with first degree AV block, poor R wave progression. Um, so she has an abnormal, an abnormal EKG. She's on flecainide, and let's see, looks like her LV function 60%. Um, she's also on a beta blocker, no energy pulse 58. Difficulty breathing when exercising, and let's see. I know you can't give a prognosis, but maybe what would be her next steps for um, being evaluated and treated for this? She says she, I think she's feeling tired on her beta blocker. She has sinus bradycardia with first degree heart block, and she's out of her AFib. Um, well, you know, again, a lot of the medication and the approach to atrial fibrillation is very personalized. And, um, you know, we'd want to, it sounds like the, the echocardiogram that was done before coming, was before coming out of atrial fibrillation is probably worthwhile, again, going back, reevaluating uh, with the energy 
and the and the symptoms that is not due to worsening of that uh, mitral valve leakage. Often after getting back into normal rhythm, though, the mitral valve might actually improve um, with lower amounts of regurgitation. Now, the lack of energy and fatigue is very common on a beta blocker. So what may have been required while she was in atrial fibrillation and going rapidly may not be a dose that's very well tolerated in normal rhythm and could be slowing the sinus node down. So it's possible that you can go down on the beta blocker, change to a different medication like a calcium channel blocker. Um, so there may be some adjustments needed in, in, in medications. Thank you. Um, we've come to the end of our hour now. I just want to end it by saying thank you to both of you. And um, Dr. Aziz, can you just kind of summarize what the Inherited Arrhythmias Clinic is about and um, the types of patients that you see with Dr. Chung there and, and, um, and to end our chat today? Sure. Uh, the Inherited Arrhythmia Clinic was really uh, devised to, to try to develop a way that we can see a family. So we can see myself seeing a pediatric patient, Dr. Chung and her colleagues seeing the parents or the grandparents, and come up with a streamlined and cohesive approach to the family. And then also, of course, personalize that approach. So we have the ability of having electrophysiology departments both on the pediatric and adult side. Being at the Cleveland Clinic, everything's housed under one big umbrella uh, so that we can, we're equipped to really manage any patient. Uh, and also have genetic counselors be part of the equation, talking to families, gathering family histories, helping us with gene testing, helping us interpret gene testing, all, all in the purpose of gathering information that helps us uh, specifically manage each individual patient in the family. Uh, and <clears throat> since its conception, I think we've really had a lot of fun doing it. We've, it it's made our care easier. Uh, I think the patients have enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing some more patients there. It's been great. Thank you very much. And thank you both for coming today and spending time with us and answering all of these questions today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the thank participants. You. Bye-bye now. Bye.